welcome back, Quant Files, to INST314, Statistics for Information Science. We're now in the second of our four video series for descriptive statistics and graphs. And in the, where the first video, we looked at univariate statistics, which is the one variable at a time. Now in the second video, we're going to be looking at bivariate statistics. So what happens when we want to look at two variables together and the information that comes from them? All right, so we're going to start moving into the bivariate descriptive statistics section. Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to bring in some of the familiar data sets we've been working with in the previous videos. We're going to be using both the housing data and the Netflix data. So here on the screen, we have the commands that are going to bring in the housing data for us yet again. And what we're going to start looking at here is a comparison between the univariate tables that we had in the last lecture, which you can start to see with just the table function. And I have two examples up there, one for the variable full base, which indicates if you have a full basement or not in your house, and the air co variable, which is an indicator if your house has air conditioning or not. Each of these, when you run them on their own, shows you a yes and a no, one variable at a time. When we do a bivariate table, now we are putting two variables together in the same table output. And we write that in R just by having the same table function like we had with the univariate, but we squeeze in a comma and then the name of the second variable, and it will put the first one in the rows and the second one in the columns. Now you're gonna have a row and a column for each category of each variable. So if we happen to say, there was a full basement had yes, no, and partial, then we could have a three by two matrix as there would be three ca categories to put into that table for the full basement. And tables themselves can be saved as objects as well that we can do all sorts of nifty things on later on that we're gonna be doing. They also have a couple different names. They're called cross tabs, contingency tables, and they have a few other things that you may find across in the readings. Let's go ahead and talk about the different parts of a contingency table. And I'm gonna start switching up some of the names back and forth just to keep you on your toes and get used to hearing the different versions they can come in. So it seems pretty intuitive that you would have a two by two table, but these things have different names to them in terms of their parts. So the inside of the table, the number at the intersection. So this particular table has support for by gender for stay at home dads. And we have the number five is the value of the number of people that are men who support this particular idea. That is our frequency inside of this table. That frequency is, has a location. Uh, you can think of it as the what number and what column position it's in. And that is called the cell, the table cell. And so we then have the numbers that sum down the columns and they sum across the rows. Those are the column and row marginals respectively. And in the bottom most right corner, we have the grand total, which is the sum of all of the frequencies in the table. Or you can think of it as the sum of the column marginals and the sum of the row marginals. They'll both add up to the grand total n for the entire table. Now, before we were saying that we had frequency counts in our table, and uh, above hand, uh, we have, again, the same table with air co and full base for air conditioning and full basement. But I've added on a function add margins onto our table. So we've nested table inside the add margins function. And that has given us the sum values for both the column marginals, the row marginals, and our grand total. If I then take that table and in between the add margins in the table, I squeeze on a prop table. And for good measure, I'm gonna also add a round onto it to the very end so I don't get really long annoying decimal chains. What I've then created is a proportions bivariate table. And the proportions inside the bivariate table, all of the cells will sum into the grand total cell of one or 100% if you're thinking in terms of percentages. Just multiply the table by 100 and, and you'll get the percentages from the proportions. So we can have it as a frequency bivariate table. We can have it as a proportions bivariate table. We can take it a little bit farther and we can do a conditional on those proportional tables. If you add a comma one as an option to the prop table, that is going to force all of the rows to sum to one. So you, you can see what the differences are across the different rows and columns when you do that. Or if you change the column 
sorry, the prop table option to two, that forces the column totals to sum to one. And so these two things with the column and row marginals with the proportions can be really useful when we start looking at the relationships between variables and their tables amongst categorical variables. We'll come back to this when we get to some of the chi-square stuff. A little bit more on these contingency tables. I've been showing you the table option, but there are other functions that do similar effects. They give you more information. They're structured differently. And so you might want to explore cross tab and cross table. Uh, they'll give you different stuff and see if one of them works better for you. But otherwise, table is the only one that you really need at this point, and it really gets the job done. If you wanted to model multi variant tables with three or more variables, then check out the function x tabs. Uh, but I just want to give you a warning, x tabs can get out of hand rather quickly. If you start pumping in too many variables, your, your tables can get too large and your output doesn't look very good when you have them. Next, I want to talk to you about correlation. Correlation is a value that is both descriptive and inferential. We note it by the Greek letter rho or the uh, Arabic letter r. Yeah, that's Arabic letters, R. Uh, it is part of a family called measures of association. And so we're going to come back to this. We're going to have a whole module section on correlations and measures of association. And the correlation itself is unitless. So it is not measured in things like kilograms or miles or how blue something is in terms of color spectrums. So it is just a unitless number that talks about how strong a couple different variables are. So in this case, I just said how strong they are. We're talking about two quantitative variables. You cannot use R for nominal variables. You should not technically use R for ordinal variables. Although if you have ordinal variables with many categories, I'd say a minimum of five, then you might be able to let it sneak under the radar, but you might have to do some extra R coding to make it behave properly. We'll take that on a case by case basis and ask me and I'll, I'll help you through it. But generally speaking, it's two quantitative variables and we're talking about the linear relationship to them. What happens to X and Y when X changes? What happens to Y and vice versa? It's bound between plus and minus one, which I'll show you a little bit more on the next slide. And then I give you the correlation formulas. The COV for the formula on the left stands for covariance and the formula on the right has what you need to calculate covariance plus a little bit more to do the entire thing. Oh, wrong direction. So I had said that on this following slide, I'm going to show you a little graphic to help you see what I mean between plus one and minus one. Down below, there are different scatter diagrams of what your data could look like if you were to plot two quantitative variables into a scatter plot. The tighter knit the dots are moving towards each other, the more they start to look like a line, regardless of the, the tilt of the line, then the stronger the correlation. The more it looks like a cloud, like a scattered buckshot from a shotgun, the less correlation it's going to have. And if you have a correlation and it's generally pointing in an upward direction as you look from left to right, it is a positive correlation. And if you look at the scatter plot and it's generally trending downward as you look from left to right, then it is a negative correlation. That would be positive means as X goes up, Y goes down, or as X goes down, Y goes down. And in the uh, negative correlations, the relationship is backwards. As X goes up, Y goes down. And as y goes up, x goes down. Numerically speaking, we see these in terms of the number values. As correlations tend towards zero, then there is no correlation, or a smaller correlation the closer you get towards zero. The closer you get towards negative one, the stronger negative correlation, and then the closer you get to positive one, the stronger the positive correlation between them. Now I have a couple little instances in the lower right corner of this slide where I have one scatter plot that kind of looks like an O and one that kind of looks like a U. Neither of these have a correlation value. There's no correlated relationship here because there's no sort of singular linear line forming. In the case of the scatter diagram that looks like an O, that uh, you can't really fit one particular line through there. You would just keep spinning a line around and around and it would never quite fit. So there's no association. Same thing with the one that's shaped like a U, but that one in the parabolic nature would say, well, as X goes down, 
y is going to go up for a little while, but then that's going to change direction and it's going to come back around. So no correlation there. Again, we'll come back to some of these in our correlation section. And to give you an example here, we're going to look at some of the Netflix data, and we're going to see if there is a correlation between the budget, how much money we can spend on the movie, and its gross, how much money did it make. So the function for this is just COR, and if we do COR on these two variables, it gives us the correlation value of a rounded 0 .0, 0 0.7. So if we look at 0 0.7 on that little scale that I give you here, we see that it is a strong positive correlation. There's a strong relationship between a movie's budget and its gross. I'd like to then introduce you to the aggregate function. The aggregate function is a nice little one because it helps us look at summary statistics of one variable by breaking it up the groups of a second variable. And in the red here, I have sort of the default template of how we can do it. You start with the function aggregate. You then give it a quantitative variable, separate it by the tilde. That's the little squiggle key that's often located on most keyboards above the tab key on the upper left corner. After that, we give it a second variable that has the grouping uh, categories to it. Comma will tell it the data set name these come from. And then after that, we're going to give it the name of the function because aggregates can be used for different purposes. And it can be used to group for two or more variables, but in this case, we're only going to look at it for one grouping and one quantitative. So in the example I'm giving to you now here, we are aggregating a movie's runtime according to its genre in the Netflix data set, and we're looking at the mean. So these are the average runtimes by genre. And so we these are sorted at the moment in alphabetical order. And so action movies in general have an average runtime of about 109 min minutes, as do adventures. Animation movies have on average 92 minutes, whereas biography have almost 118 and so on through these different genres. So this is a, a bivariate table looking at the genres by runtime. We can tweak this a little bit by saving the aggregate function as an object. I've saved it as AG. And then I do a filtering option on AG where I said order it by runtime in a decreasing order. So then that's going to produce my outputs here for my uh, aggregate options, but it's going to put my longest running movies on average up at the top and the shortest running movies on average at the bottom. You could have also done decreasing equals false or F, and it would put the shortest movies at the top and the longest ones at the bottom. Now we're going to intermittently have dplyr popping its head up here, and what we're going to look here is dplyr and the tidyverse in general uses this little tool called pipes or piping. And symbolically, it's a percent sign greater than symbol percent sign. And what that means is take what's ever function on here on this line and send it directly into the next row of instructions and keep it going. So we're doing a similar situation here where we are summarizing the average run times of by genre, but instead of using it with the aggregate function, I'm using it with uh, options from the dplyr package and how the coding structure would be there for the tidyverse. So I've got the library function to activate dplyr, and then I'm calling the Netflix data set, putting a pipe in, sending it to the next row. And I'm using a group by option in there to group it by genre, and then I've got the pipe operators sending it to the next row. Summarize the runtime variable by the mean of runtime, pipe it to the next variable, and arrange my output by a descending runtime. So it's a bit in more intuitive, relatively easier to understand, but it takes a little bit of practice to kind of work through these line by lines and use these pipe and operators. So you don't have to do that. You can use whatever is comfortable for you between this version or the aggregate, or uh, there are other versions out there as well, as long as you're able to get to the data accordingly. What I'm going to show you here then is going to be this last example where we are going to also uh, use the dplyr option here. And this is one area that it sort of shines is we can actually have multiple columns here. So in this particular case, we're grouping by the genre. We're summarizing by the average runtime. We're also doing an average score. 
we're doing a mean budget and a sum budget. So how much did it make on total and how much did it make on average? And then we're going to arrange these descending by runtime first. And so what we have here, this is a nice little option for the dplyr package, is our tibble shows that we have our different genres of uh, stuff on Netflix, the movies, but then we have four different summary statistic columns that we can have on. So it was a nice easy way to keep appending on additional summary statistics in this sort of bivariate analysis and we can look at them there. Note also in the runtime column it has arranged the variables so that the decimal point is always in the same spot so you're not going to have any sort of odd overlaps and perhaps accidentally misread some of the uh, information there. But this is going to go ahead and wrap up the video on bivariate descriptive statistics, and I'll see you all for the next one, where we start looking at tables, charts, graphs, plots, and all that other good visual stuff.